This story is about how I ended up having pretty major surgery on my neck. And before I get into it, um, I want to first tell you I apologize because I'm really tired. And I'm going to tell this story a little bit slower than I normally speak. Partially because I'm tired, but also because I think it will be more suspenseful. We'll see. Not that it's a suspenseful story, but we'll see if I can make it more suspenseful. Although, you've never heard the story, so anyways, whatever. Um, so I'm gonna go all the way back and start from the beginning. And it begins once upon a time. I've always wanted to do that. I was 20 years old, and I was working construction at the time, and it, it was in the summertime, I remember that. And after work, one of my co-workers and one of my best friends, still one of my best friends to this day, we decided to go swimming at a local lake. And this lake, where, where we went, it had a dock. And we decided that we were going to uh, dive into the water like on like they do on Baywatch. And so we were running as fast as we could. And we would run and dive off the end of the dock. And it was fun. Until this one time I went to dive in. The last time I went to dive in and... I guess my head was kind of turned to the side a little bit, or kind of tilted to one side. And I ended up spraining my neck. I hit the water pretty hard because I was running, as sprinting as fast as I could before I dove in. And when I hit the water, there was a little pop My neck instantly hurt, so I went to the doctor. They did x-rays. Thankfully, nothing was broken. So they diagnosed me with a sprained neck. I didn't even know that that was a thing. Didn't know you could do that. But if you want to do that, that's how you do it. Um, and I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember. I think I did maybe a couple of weeks of physical therapy. But I don't, it's kind of foggy. I, you know, that was 20 years ago. I think I did do some physical therapy, but not much. And so after that, I, everything was fine. My neck felt fine. I was in good shape, and I went ab about my life. Flash forward to about... Uh, I was 25. And at the time, I was going to college. I didn't start college until later. I didn't start college until I was 22. I wanted to pursue my dream of being a musician after high school, so I did that. That didn't pan out, but that's okay. I tried. So I ended up not going to college until 22. Anyways, um, 
for some reason, that quarter I had decided to sign up for a 7 a.m. accounting class. I don't know what in the hell I was thinking. I'm a night owl, so... <laughs> yeah, I must have been out of my mind, to be honest. Or maybe it was the only class that I could take and still work, because I was working uh, full-time and going to school. It was December, and I remember it was frosty out that morning, but my car was parked in the garage. We had a house with a, car, a garage, so... I didn't have to scrape my windows, but I pulled out to go to class, pulled out of the end of my street, and turned, and at the end of that road, probably about a mile from my house, there was a stop sign. I came to the stop sign, and I remember there was a white van in front of me, and I came to a stop. And I looked down at my radio to adjust the dial and change the station. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something and I looked up and I was still kind of like my head turned to the right a little bit, looking down. And I looked up just in time to see the front end of a Chevy Impala, one of the newer ones, well new at the time, it was probably like an 03 Chevy Impala, racing right towards me at about 35 miles an hour, at least that's what they said, they, their estimate of how fast he was going, no brakes. And I'm at a dead stop. And the only reaction that I had in that moment was to slam my foot on the brake. I don't remember tensing up any other part of my body other than pushing my foot down on the brake. And then, just the smash into the back of me. And I'm really grateful that I didn't you know, put my foot on the gas, or that I at least had the instinct to put my foot on the brake, because I didn't actually hit the car in front of me, surprisingly. Again, I'm at a dead stop, and it, this Chevy Impala just slammed into the back of me, no brakes, going 35 miles an hour. So, immediately after, you know, my ears are ringing, and I'm just kind of like, what the hell just happened? To my left was the fire station. And so I pulled into the parking lot of the fire station, and he pulled in behind me, and he gets out, and he's super apologetic. He's younger than I was. I was 25. I think he was like 19 or 20. And he was visibly shaking. He was more shaken up than I was. So he exchanged information. He apologized to me probably 157 times. And this is before smartphones. I had a flip phone. But I think I might have taken pictures. I, I don't really remember. You know, in those moments, you just kind of, you're not thinking clearly. But I do remember looking at the back of my car, and the back side panel 
panels on both sides are smashed. The bumper is just completely obliterated. Both of my sets of taillights are smashed. My trunk is kind of folded in half. However, the car was still technically drivable. The wheel well was rubbing against the tire as I drove. But yeah, I looked I looked at my car and then I looked at the front of his car. There was hardly any damage to his car. Unbelievable. So I'm standing there and I'm looking at the cars in the parking lot of the fire station. I didn't call the cops. I don't know why. I didn't report the accident until after the fact. But it's okay. I got his information. And I decided to drive the car back to my house because it was only about a mile away. And I got in the car, got back on the road, and I remember driving on the shoulder because I didn't want to, because again, like my wheel well is like rubbing up against my tire. I didn't want my whole bumper to fly off. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I'm driving back on the shoulder of the road. Well, the guy that hit me, he turns around and he follows me on the shoulder of the road and he had already apologized like I said a million times and I just kind of wanted to get away from him I think in my mind I was like this guy's bad luck stay away from me but he followed me and then I get to my street and I get in the in the lane off the shoulder and into the drive lane put my blinker on and I take a left. He follows me onto my street and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? So, it, I lived on a cul-de-sac and so I live, literally live at the very end of the street and I'm driving down the road and about two driveways before I get to my place, he turns into one of the driveways. Turns out he's my neighbor. And, oh, I forgot to tell you. The whole reason why he slammed at the back of me. When we pulled off in the parking lot of the fire station, I noticed his windshield was still frosted. He, you know, when you turn on the, the defrost and you just get that little thin strip where you can, where you can see, dang it, where you can see, like, just like a tiny bit. Well, it turns out he was late for class, too, and he didn't want to spend the time to defrost his window or to, like, scrape his window and was just going to drive until it cleared up. I, I found this all out later, but yeah, that's the reason why he slammed into the back of me is because he literally couldn't see out of his windshield. So I call the insurance and they send a tow truck and the tow truck driver gets it up on the on the truck and he, you know we can see underneath it and he's like, yeah, this thing's totaled. He pointed out a few cracks in the frame. I miss that car. It was a Honda Accord. Nothing special. Except it was special to me. <laughs> it was gold, I remember. It was a gold Honda Accord. It had gold leather seats. It was a coupe. It was only a two-door. But man, that thing could go pretty fast, actually. I remember driving through the desert of Nevada and listening to the Batman soundtrack. 
at night. God, that was fun. Anyways, so, um, so yeah, the cars totaled, and um, to make a long story longer, um, the his insurance company ended up. I had to fight back and forth with them to get the right amount of money to you know buy an equivalent car. So I fought back and forth with them for a couple of weeks, but then they wouldn't pay for any medical. So then I had to get a lawyer. And I, by the way, I have never gone through anything like this before, so I was totally, like, I had no idea what to do. I have no idea, like, how I'm supposed to handle this situation. So I just called up a lawyer, and I was like, I don't know what to do. So she's like, well, you need to get better, so go see this chiropractor. So I went to the chiropractor, and he took x-rays, and he's like, oh yeah, like, look at that curb. He's like, you got, I'm not even, I don't even remember exactly what he said. But he prescribed me coming in, I think, three days a week and then getting massage therapy once a week, which I was totally down for. Free massages every weekend. Yes, please. So I started doing that. And I did that for about three months. After three months, the pain wasn't gone. It actually had felt pretty much exactly the same. Um, the day of the accident, my neck just kind of felt like jello. It didn't really hurt that bad, but it it started to hurt in the, in the next couple of days after the accident. But it was more just like, just kind of a general like kink in your neck. It wasn't anything extreme. But if you've ever had neck pain, you know how debilitating it can be, and annoying it can be as well. You don't realize how much you use your neck until you hurt it. So, after about three months, I'm like, this isn't working for me. So I went to my primary care physician, and I told him what happened, and he said, I'm going to refer you to an orthopedist. So I went and saw the orthopedist later that day, and I told him, I got into this accident. I've been seeing a chiropractor for the last three months. His first response was, Who told you to go see a chiropractor? My lawyer. He's like, well, you most likely have soft tissue damage. Stop going to the chiropractor. A chiropractor cracking your neck is probably making it worse and could potentially make it much worse. So he ordered an MRI, and sure enough, I had soft tissue damage. I herniated two discs, C5 and C6 on the right side. And uh, he used a really great analogy. Um, you might have heard this before. So a herniated disc is, think of your discs like, like a jelly donut, um, your vertebrae. I'm probably sorry, medical experts, doctors, nurses. I'm going to butcher this. But your, your vertebrae from, from the top down is kind of, it's got these two wing thingies <laughs> that stick out. And then you have a, a, a disc, you know, the soft tissue disc, and then you have your, your spinal column, all the nerve endings to your, coming from your brain stem, come down your spinal column, right? And then you have nerve endings that, you know, fly out between, or each vertebrae has its own nerve endings, and so C5, and C6, they come out down, like, where I had the pinched nerve was affecting, like, my right, uh, like, kind of, like, back trap here, shoulder, and then on the outside of my shoulder, and then down my arm into these, like, two fingers, my ring finger, my middle finger, and then occasionally I had could feel it in my thumb a little bit, but just this kind of general numbing 
sensation, loss of feeling. And so after I got the MRI and confirmed that, that was what was happening, uh, he prescribed me physical therapy, and so I started going to a physical therapy twice a week. I could still keep doing the massages, so that was awesome. And then uh, just doing cervical traction twice a week. And after about six months, it went away. And I was mostly back to normal. Um, the one lingering thing from the accident that still is there today is a crunching sound. I, only I can hear it because it's like inside of my neck. I mean, maybe if you put a microphone up to it, you might be able to hear the crunching, but I mean, I have, I have full mobility. I'm a little bit tight in my right arm, but um, yeah, so that was in 2005 that that happened, and flash forward about nine and a half years. And uh, 2014, 2015 time frame, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly, I was into yoga a lot, and I started doing quite a bit of yoga. And I was doing a stretch. I was down visiting, down Southern California, visiting my parents, and I was doing yoga in the backyard. And I was doing a stretch that I'd done before, but it put a lot of strain on my neck. And I think that that's maybe what had done it. Where um, I, I kind of got the same sensation I did after the accident, where it was just kind of like, something's not quite right. So, uh, it was my last day down there. And I go home. To Seattle, and the next day it was it, my neck was really hurting, and it was a Monday. I go back to work and um, took some Advil and was just powered through it. Tuesday rolls around and hurts even more. Wednesday hurts even more. Thursday I'm like I don't I don't know if I can go to work. I ended up going to work. And I was, knowing myself, I was probably just taking a bunch of Advil. Not the right thing to do. And then Friday, I somehow made it to work. And I, honestly, looking back, I don't know why I ended up going in. Because I was worthless. I ended up sitting in one of the conference rooms, just reeling in pain. And I remember getting to work and calling the hospital... I was able to get an appointment. I wanted to see a specialist, you know, somebody, you know, that could look at my neck and know what they're talking about. I didn't want to just go to a primary care physician, not to knock on primary care physicians, but I knew what was going on. This wasn't my first rodeo, right? So I ended up getting an appointment with a physiatrist which I didn't even know what that was. Apparently it's an orthopedic surgeon who doesn't do surgery, but they do everything else. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but um, I think that that's what, they're, what they primarily do. Anyways, I, I was able to get in on a Friday afternoon with this doctor, and... The whole day at work, I am just, I am, I, I am unlike myself. I am like punching the table. I am punching walls. I am in, I, when I started the day, I was probably at about a 6 out of 10 pain scale. And by the time I got into that doctor's office, I was in white knuckle, 
screaming at people pain. It was like a nine and a half out of ten. And the doctor, bless his heart, he recognized the pain that I was in immediately gave me some um, some oxycodone. Now, for those of you that don't, don't know what oxycodone is, it's an opiate. It's one of the drugs that um, a lot of people get hooked on. You know, we talk about like an opiate, you know, opiate epidemic, um, or narcotics, like that's, you know, part of it. Um, that's, oxycodone's pretty heavy stuff. Um, so he gave me that, and that was like a massive, massive relief. The most relief I'd had all week. And unfortunately, the imaging center was shut down for the weekend, so he decided to give me a prescription of it. I think you might know where this is going. So, I'm in with, without any medication. I'm experiencing a 9 out of 10 pain. Um, Advil was like... Like, didn't even phase me. Like, didn't even help at all. Uh, the only thing that helped was the oxycodone. So he gave me a prescription. Got me through the weekend. I ended up getting another MRI, which showed the pinched nerve in my neck. And he said, you know, there's, there's three routes we can go. One, we can try physical therapy and cervical traction. But, you know, I'd been down that route, and while it was helpful, um, it wasn't something I was necessarily willing to entertain. Because I didn't believe, and, and my doctor agreed with me. He's like, you know, you can do this, but it might it might be too far gone. When you get a herniated disc, it's like a jelly donut. And imagine if I had a jelly donut in my hands and I cover the top and the bottom and I push down. You can imagine what's going to happen to the jelly. It's going to squeeze out one side. Well, I was kind of tilted my head to the right and back during the accident. So the path of least resistance when my head snapped back was for it to go forward and slightly to the left, which was directly towards my spinal column and right towards my dural sac, where all my nerve endings are. So he thought, he was like, you know, I think you're too far gone for that, that but that is an option. The second option is to get a cortisone injection. So, um... Essentially, what they would do is they would literally inject a needle into my spine and then inject cortisone. It's supposed to, like, kind of, you know, protect the herniation a little bit and possibly you know, relieve some of the pain and suffering that I was going through. So I opted for that, and he really was adamant about me doing that before I jumped into surgery. So I said yes to the injection, and we ended up scheduling it, but this was after I had to get the MRI screening, and then schedule another appointment for us to look at it together. And then, after that consultation, then he had to schedule the cortisone injection. And they couldn't get me in for a while, like a week, a week and a half. So by the time I get the injection, I've been on oxycodone for about two weeks to manage this intense pain. And with oxycodone, you can build up a tolerance to it. And so by the time my first prescription ran out, I was taking much more than I was when I started the prescription. And that was just to keep the pain away. Or at least the pain manageable. So he upped my prescription, my, my dosage.
dosage, I was taking 10 milligrams of oxycodone um, a couple of times a day at that point. So I get the cortisone injection. And then I have to wait a week, minimum of one week, to see how I feel, to see if it worked. And then after that week, then, then I can make the decision of how I want to proceed. Well, kind of as expected, it didn't work. Um, and it's honestly, it's a terrible experience to get an injection into your spine. And they even had an x-ray machine right in front of me so I could watch it in real time go into my neck. I don't know why they offered that, but now that, now that I think about it, I didn't ask for it. They just did it. They just pulled the screen in front of me and I watched it. Anyways, so after that week, now it's been three weeks since I first went to the doctor, and now I've got three weeks of taking oxycodone. So then I had another follow-up appointment with the doctor to have him refer me to the surgeon. So I met with, I think, uh, the head of neurology, or neurological medicine, something like that. Um, and again, guys, I was like, I was high on drugs this whole time, right? I'm on opiates. So, um, what I remember is going in and meeting with the surgeon after, you know, several days of, like, trying to schedule, and then he talks me through it, and then I go ahead with it, and then I have to schedule the surgery itself, and they couldn't get me in for, like, another week and a half or something like this. In total, I was on the opiates for about six weeks, and in that time frame, I went from zero milligrams all the way up to taking over a hundred milligrams a day of oxycodone. And I remember getting the surgery. The surgery was super early in the morning, or I had to be there at seven. The surgery was scheduled for nine. I was home before noon. And the surgery only took like an hour, and it's very, very basic. They cut me open. They like pull the muscles aside. And this is from the back, so they drill a hole, you know, the little wing thing I was telling you about. So they drill a hole in the side of my vertebrae, and then they go in with these little pinchers, and they just clip out where the herniated disc is, grab it, pull it out, staple me shut. They don't fill the hole in my vertebrae that's still there. And no brace, no physical therapy. They just sent me home. And I remember waking up in the hospital bed and immediately I knew that it was fixed. The pain or the numbness was gone. I wasn't in much pain because I had, I had, I was, you know, I had taken oxycodone and then that day, that morning, and then they gave me, um, you know, anesthesia. And then I remember when I got out of the hospital and got back home, I immediately wrote a taper down schedule because I wanted to be off this shit. Don't get me wrong, I like oxycodone, it feels good, but this shit is crazy addictive. And at the end of the day, it's just not, not a good thing. Not a good thing. I highly, uh, I, I, I condemn the drug. I, I think that it has its its place. It was a lifesaver for me, but to use it recreational is just do not do it. Please do not do it. I mean, I wasn't doing it recreationally. 
I, I was seriously in, in some crazy amount of pain. But I guess what I'm saying is like, I now understand what it's like to get addicted to this stuff. And I understand why people get addicted to this stuff. And here's why. My taper down schedule was very rushed in hindsight. And I remember writing the taper schedule down on a piece of paper in my kitchen. And a buddy of mine came over just to check up on me. And he saw this. And he, he at the time he was a bartender and he's he's met a lot of people that you know have been addicted to this stuff. And he looked, he took one look at it and he was like, I'm really concerned about this schedule, man. He's like, you are not going to this is not going to be easy at all. He's like, I highly recommend that you slow this, like double this time period. I remember telling him, like, I have to get off this stuff. I cannot be on this any longer than I need to be. I'm like, I don't care what the symptoms are of, of weaning myself off. I, I, I just have to get, I have to get this out of my system. And so the first couple of days were, were fine. I could definitely feel like something wasn't right. But after the f about the fourth day, uh, I was now taking about probably about half of the dosage I was taking the day of the surgery. And oh my god. Withdrawal symptoms of coming off of opiates is a living nightmare. And I mean that in the truest sense of the, of, of the phrase. It is, I'm going to get emotional here, like it is, it is one of the hardest and most challenging moments and times of my life was coming off of that drug. And I fought through the symptoms, which included uh, uh, night terrors, um, hot sweats, cold sweats. Um, nothing, nothing can keep me warm. I'm freezing cold, and then I'm crazy, it's like sweating, dripping in sweat, hot, vomiting, diarrhea, um, like like cloudy brain I was like I, for the first time in my life I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin I couldn't sit still because I just wanted to claw my skin off I didn't really have an appetite and if you've ever seen that commercial I haven't seen it in several years but there's a commercial of a guy who is, like, in his underwear, like, shaking violently in the fetal position on the floor of his bathroom. That's literally what it's like. And my newfound understanding of what it's like to come off of that drug, I suddenly realized that the people that are addicted drugs like this, it's not necessarily, it may not necessarily be that they're addicted to the feeling of the drug. It's just that they're scared of the withdrawal. Because I'll tell you what, if, if I was addicted to that drug recreationally, and I had access to it, I... I, I don't know that I would be able to stop, to be honest. I mean, it was a living nightmare, you guys. Like, literally the worst time of my life, from a physical perspective. That was awful. But, um, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I got the 
surgery, I ended up pulling through those symptoms after about, it was probably about a, a, a week before I finally felt better. Like, I was totally off the drugs about two weeks after the surgery. And I just remember, um, yeah, like, never, ever wanting to take it again unless I absolutely have to. Um, thankfully, nothing has ever happened since that I've needed to take it. The day of the surgery, I took a picture of the, uh, the incision. And so if you're, if you're squeamish at all, or you don't like blood and guts, not that there's like a bunch of like blood squirting out of it, it's a picture. But uh, I wanted to show you the staples that they put in the back of my neck. So if you're a little squeamish, like turn away, don't look. So as you can see, there are several staples in the back of my neck. This is the only picture that I have, but um, but yeah, towards the bottom, they they like used like a I don't know what they were thinking. They, they have there's like a flap of skin that's like kind of bunched up, and now on my scar, there's kind of this bump towards the bottom. I don't know. I think they could have done a better job, but okay, you can you can turn back now. So that is my story. That's um, uh, how I ended up getting some neck surgery done. Uh, the doctors at Swedish were uh, Virginia Mason, excuse me. Uh, well, the doctors at Swedish are pretty awesome too, but um, yeah, uh, my neck is is fine now. I do have um, I do have tension in my neck. I think I always will. Um, I think I have some scarring back there, or maybe some uh, some muscle memory of my my body trying to protect my neck. Still. Um, and so, you know, getting massages are feel amazing. They always do, but especially I, I, I make them, you know, place extra emphasis on my neck um, because of what happened. And so, and of course now I'm like super scared of getting rear-ended again. So whenever I'm sitting at a stoplight, I'm constantly, like my head is back against the headrest and I'm, I'm watching for someone coming up behind me. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, modern medicine is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be back and like, I have full mobility and uh, I really don't think about it anymore. So um, yeah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share this story with you. Um, it's definitely a, a something a part of my life that makes me who I am. Um, it's one of those things that, um, you know, when life happens to you instead of happening for you, you know, most of what I do in life, I, I, um, you know, I try to make life happen for me. Um, but, you know, this accident was some, a moment when life happened to me. And I didn't have a choice, so all I can do is take the positive from it and, um, you know, learn a few things about myself and about modern medicine and, and neck surgery and all that. And, um, yeah, so, again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. All right, bye.